This week's episode is in partnership with Intact Insurance, here for you and for everything you care about. Welcome, everybody, that old familiar tune. Like an old friend, like finding an old piece of jewelry. This is Jan Arden. You're listening to the Jan Arden Podcast. I'm here with Caitlin Green and Adam Karsh is in studio in his basement running all of this. All of us are working from home still. I believe we're on week six. I'm just gonna, I'm not going to count days anymore, but we're well into week six. Caitlin, give us an update. Well, let's see what I've been doing. I feel like we were talking about this just before we started recording, but I feel like dare I say it, I'm kind of getting used to being in lockdown mode. I have my little schedule. I have like, you know, we try new recipes. We, you know, know that we have to do our LCBO order every probably two weeks here. Like do your little routine in the morning. I get up, I do the morning show that I work on. I do lunch. I have my workout maybe less often than I probably should. (laughs) And it's just, I kind of am settling into it. We have Zoom hangouts with some friends every Friday night. We do trivia over Zoom with another group of friends at least once a week. Like I'm, I'm kind of falling into a groove. Yeah. It's definitely, um, somehow, well, we get, you you get used to anything. You get used to anything. You, you can acclimate to pretty much anything in this life. It's not like, um, we're, we're being asked to be in a concrete bunker 40 feet, you know, below the surface of the earth. Um, and, and like we've said before on the show, it's very different from household to household. And my heart certainly goes out to, you know, people that are in, you know, not great, um, situations. Um, and I always think of that when I'm going to bed, cause I feel so grateful. Like I'm, I'm just living in such a state of gratitude and I felt like I always did, but this has really made me realize how much further I needed to go in that department. Like I always thought, Oh, you're so grateful and you're grateful for the stuff that you have. And, and really I I can't say that that's completely true. Six weeks down the road. I feel like yeah. I, I, I was very, le- I was very learned, very schooled in, in what gratitude really looks like. You probably were were grateful, you know, at the time, like given that circumstance, but yeah, everyone's operating in this new reality and everything's been pared back so much in terms of what you can do and your day-to-day life that now those little things that I think every single person probably overlooked, at least, at least, you know, the people that I knew here in North America, especially my friends and coworkers in Toronto, like now I keep thinking that I've never felt more like a, like a dog, like a house pet. Cause you know, the, <laughs> the, the excitement that dogs get to just go for a walk. Like I yeah. get it now, you yeah. know, sticking your head out of a car window, the joy of just fresh air going down the road to Loblaws here. Like that's real. That's very well, real. Think about it. Most dogs are inside most of the day. Yeah. Their people, their people go off to work. Like they're quarantined most of the day. They don't, they're in a house. They, they have the one meal before their parents leave. They might have a dog walker come. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think we've all been very awoken to the plight of animals in captivity, animals in circuses, uh, a lot of animals like in zoos, Mm -hmm. uh, animals at uh, wildlife markets that are sold as pets and food and all these things that are living in captivity and we're getting a very, very small taste of it. Um, There's an interesting thing kind of happening too. Um, You know, we talk about being home and being out of the rat race and not, being on those schedules that are kind of oppressive when we mm-hmm. think about how quickly we love our lives. So there, there was this question asked, where have all the heart attacks gone? And people are like hospitals, doctors, walk-in clinics. There's been a, a, a huge decline in heart attacks, uh, like weird things like gallbladder operations, which are one of the most highly Uh, It's not an elective surgery. It's a surgery you have to get done, but it's one of the most common surgeries that people get. Uh, Appendectomies, strokes. So what's your guys' take on it? Um, Adam, I want to ask you just because you're a guy and guys are so stupid about heart attacks (laughs) because they have them and they never even go to the hospital. So why do you think this stuff's happening? I think that stress has gone down a lot. 
at least for me. I'm not saying that I have nothing to do. I'm not saying that there aren't challenges um, in terms of balancing work and family because we're all on top of each other 24 seven. But I don't, find, I'm not, I don't find that I'm stressed. So maybe that's part of it. It's not the daily grind. Yep. So you think your heart's just like beating a little bit differently and I find it weird. I find it really weird that heart attacks are down and strokes are down. Like what the actual hell? <laughs> but is, isn't that like a real reflection of what's happening to our physical bodies because of, I mean, because of the way we're friggin' racing around. Well, my husband and I were talking about this last night. It's crazy, like, how much slower our lives are. We were saying, you know, April for both of us, this month for both of us, would have involved a lot of travel for work. It would have involved a lot of working during the day and then having work events at night, not getting anywhere near enough sleep, and just, fit, like, physically going from place to place to place and barely having a second to sit on the sofa to check in with your loved ones and to sleep. That, that really has been... A, a wake up call for me too. Um, I was saying to you guys last week or the week before that this is the longest stretch that I've ever been home. And I think there's a lot of changes that I want to make. I mean, obviously I can't wait to get back to my job and get out there and do, you know, touring. And I love doing the speaking engagements. I mean, there's so many fun things about my job that I really love, but I also know that I don't want to do as much as I've been doing. I think I'd like to take, you know, really just, just take a, a look at, at jobs that I'm taking and things. I'm going to say no more. I really am. And a lot of people are on the other side of that fence going, I'm going to say yes to everything. I'm going to get in there and do more than I was doing. And, and I understand that too. There's a couple of things that are happening. It's either the people that weren't really doing enough. They're like, why am I, why have I been living my life like this? It's so short. But on my side of the fence, it's just like, I don't think I want to be in a plane every week. I, I just don't. And um, so it's given me a lot to ponder. I think you're completely right that it's people are really in two categories. The friends I have or the coworkers I have who say, you know, I've been laying around and haven't been saying yes to enough stuff. So I'm going to get out there and travel and going to put myself out there more often. And then I feel exactly as you do. I'm going to have to start saying no more just because I physically wasn't sleeping. Like I would just say, I would, I would never prioritize my own health. I would never prioritize working out if I could squeeze in just a little extra something, another event, another set of plans, another thing to do for work. I would always wind up just defaulting to that. And I was never resting. And I, in a weird way, I feel physically a little bit better right now than I had in, you know, February for sure. How about mentally? Mentally, I have a different type of like sort of free floating existential anxiety right now, just about the world. What um, does that feel like? Like, explain that to me. Is it, are, are um, you worrying? Are you scared? Are you, wh yeah, wh what is it? I think worrying for sure about things that are kind of beyond my control. A lot of worrying about other people, frankly. Um, I worry about my, you know, my mom currently is in like serious isolation because she has health issues that put her at a really serious risk. So she like, honestly, she can't leave that can barely leave the house. Does she so have worry. a partner? No. So she's alone. Oh. And uh, so we, you know, my husband and I will drop off a care package to her at least once a week at, at a safe distance. And we'll yeah. walk around to the backyard and talk to her while she stands on the porch. And we sort of look at the garden with her. We do as much as we can, but you know, I know that it's very taxing for her. It's taxing for my, uh, my husband's grandmothers who both, again, they're alone. They're in their nineties and they're a very healthy, active, sharp 90, but they also can't leave the house because they're incredibly high risk. So I worry about all those people. And, you know, I worry about the people you see in your everyday community. I mean, I think that homeless people are a lot more visible because with the streets empty, when you see people on the street right now, you notice that a lot of them are probably in precarious housing situations, especially here in Toronto. So I think about, I think about that. So you just kind of like, like you said, it's empathetic. And I think that's a good thing for like humanity, but also sometimes it's overwhelming to feel, to feel for everybody who's going through some stuff right now. It's so frustrating. I, I hate to even say these words, but I'm like, I'm glad my parents are gone. And I, I, I know what that seems like coming out of my mouth and it feels horrible to me. And I hope people don't, think badly of me, but I'm so glad my parents aren't here. I'm glad my mom's not quarantined in her memory care manner. And 
and not understanding why I'm not there. Like, I don't even know if she would have remembered that I wasn't there, but um, I would have, would have been so worried about her care and, and the staff and, and not being able to be with her if she got suddenly sick. And yeah. like, I was with my mom when she passed away and I was with my dad when he passed away. Yeah. And, and I know for people right now, I am getting letters. I'm so sorry about my dog. She thinks it's playtime. <laughs> Come here. Um, I just feel for people that their parents are going through chemotherapy and or their husbands are, or they can't, you know, they've got parents that are terminally ill or, or partners or siblings, and they're not able to go and visit them. Like, so I, I know what you mean, Caitlin, about, about that worrying about other people. Whenever I have a split second of kind of feeling, you know, a little bit sorry for myself, I feel ridiculous. I feel ashamed. I shake it off and I get my head on straight. And I'm just thinking my energy and my focus and my prayers and positivity needs to be focused on a, a group of people that are going through such shite that it is terrible to think about. Unbearable to think about. And that's the anxiety that I feel like I didn't, I mean, I always had a little bit of it, but I certainly didn't have it at this scale. So that's, that's kind of the the downside of it. But I do think that it's made some people who probably never necessarily took the time to feel that way or to consider all those different angles in life, they're doing it. And it might make all of us a little more empathetic on the other side. No kidding. Well, we're going to come back and uh, talk about some fun, positive things when we come back. But, you know, hey, listen, we're not here just to, 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 talk, to skim the surface. Everyone is really struggling, but, you know, there's, there's plus, pluses and, and negatives to this. And we're going to come back and talk about, <laughs> we're going to, well, Tom Hanks is in there. Anyway, come back, <laughs> come back. Yeah, you're listening to the Jan Arden Podcast. We were just talking about, um, a whole bunch of stuff. And we are going to talk about Tom Hanks's house uh, <laughs> very shortly. But uh, in the, in the first, uh, you know, part of the show, we were talking about heart attacks being down, gallbladder surgeries being down, strokes being down in general, people do not want to go to a hospital. So I'm hoping that it's not people suffering at home going, there's no damn way I'm going in and getting, <laughs> taking a chance. I don't think that's it. I think it's the pace in which we live our life. So Adam was telling us on the break, and I said, you have to tell everybody this, of his friggin' routine in the morning of just getting his children to school. And I think so many of you listening can relate to this. So pretty much five days a week, I have a mini heart attack every day because <laughs> I have to, like my wife starts the morning, she gets the girls like up and out of bed and she usually starts breakfast. And then I come down and then I get them dressed and, or not dressed, but like dressed like in their winter gear and then take them to school. And then I go to the train and I have to like get them in their snow pants and then get them into the car, trying to like manage if there's a fight going on. And then I have to drop them off at school, get them out of the car. Then I have to drive to the train station and make sure I'm on time for the train so I can get down to work and then walk from the train station to the radio station. It's bananas. Every, that's five days a week. And that is highly stress inducing. So why do you let yourself get to that place of that it's so chaotic? Can't you just sort of, has this given you any indication of how to put that in perspective now, Adam? Like, it's not the end of days. And I totally get that. And, and I, I understand. I'm not a parent myself, but you've just made me feel like I was thinking of getting artificially inseminated at 58 and perhaps out of the But you have just once again talked me out of that. So uh, I know you're every parent. Well, Caitlin, too. Are you guys having pa- kids, Caitlin? Is that too personal? Well, I don't know. We haven't, like, we thought about it. We, we go back and forth. And then we were kind of more on the, the fourth in terms of having them recently. And then this, and then this happened though. And so now I'm like, I'm not getting pregnant in the middle of a viral pandemic. Like, forget it. I'm on the back now. (laughs) No, I I totally get it. And I know there's parents out there and I've thought a lot about them too, of the homeschooling stuff. And do you feel, do you feel, uh, Adam, less, less stressed having them at home? Way less stress. It's lovely. It's absolutely lovely. Well, that's the opposite of what I thought a dad would say. I would, I was thinking that you'd be like, "Oh man, this is just zaniness having them here twenty four seven. But you sound like you're managing. Well, it is zany sometimes, and it does get crazy, and especially when we're trying to uh, balance working and and giving them lunch or, or whatever like that. 
sure, it gets it gets uh, crazy. But in terms of the daily grind not existing and just being at home and going for an afternoon walk or bike ride and just being right. around and not having to pick them up and get them in the car, schlep them in the morning and get to school at the end of the day in the aftercare program. Listen, I want you to be grateful for that when we come out of this. I want you to be, I want you to be putting their snow pants on going, this is the best damn day. Listen, we're all doing this from our respective homes right now. And, and what I want to talk about is like right now, Caitlin, I, I know I'm looking at a toilet to the left of her, her cabinet. <laughs> she's got three matching towels. I think yep. you've got blinds in your bathroom. No, that's my shower curtain. No, that's your shower curtain. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm looking at that. I like the, 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 uh, the, the patina on your cabinets. Yeah. Uh, Adam, I'm looking at all kinds of water bottles. I can see a couple of guitars back there. I don't know if that's a keyboard or a case. Keyboard. Uh, I see knickknacks on uh, like an Ikea shelf. Yeah. Um, your chair, you probably bought that at Rona and had to put it together yourself, I would imagine. <laughs> but we are getting a chance, uh, uh, a real peek into people's homes. Like Tom Hanks, for instance, hosted SNL last week. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was in his kitchen and he took a whole bunch of flack for, well, your kitchen's not very fancy, like for Tom Hanks. Uh, it, I guess people expected some kind of, I don't know, the lobby of the Carl, Ritz Carlton Hotel. Um, so it's, it's, we're looking into everybody's homes and we're being really kind of judgmental. Thoughts? I mean, I'm not surprised because we, we talked about, uh, I talked about this on the morning show I work on about Tom Hanks' SNL and instantly I had like a handful of listeners all either say, wow, his kitchen was way worse than I thought, or they were calling him out and saying, I don't even think that was his kitchen. I think that must've been in his like, I think that must've been in his like guest house or something because there's no way Tom Hanks has a kitchen that crappy. And I thought, well, what about everybody who just has a more regular home than you'd think or who doesn't, you know, doesn't care if their house looks like something at Architectural Digest? That's really what you're getting a look at. It's like it's like the pandemic version of MTV Cribs or or Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Well, there's a there's a concert coming up on CTV, a little plug for CTV there. Yes, um, tonight. It's, 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 oh, I'm sorry. It is. It's tonight. I keep yeah. thinking, where are we in the week? It's tonight. <laughs> it is a massive concert. Um with you know Billie Eilish, Celine Dion, uh, Alanis Morissette. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and name 20 names, but the most recent addition to the show is the Rolling Stones. Now, the Rolling Stones, the four of them that are going to be doing this concert, are not in the same home. So no. everybody is speculating on how they're going to be putting this together, drumming, bass, guitar, and then mix singing. So uh, please tune in tonight. But I, I wonder what sneak peeks we're going to be seeing inside the houses of Celine or Alanis or all these people doing these concerts, Coldplay. Um, gosh, there's some really big stars. So I'm going to be watching for sure just to see their damn houses. It's the reason why people still watch these architectural digest videos or the Vogue videos on social media, where they go to people's houses and ask them 75 questions. The whole reason that they do this is because people want to see the inside of someone's house. Whenever there's a real estate listing in LA, you know, um, Taylor Swift lists her home or Kim Kardashian tours her Bel Air mansion. People, those things are such clickbait. Everyone just loves it. And I think that's exactly what's going to happen with this concert tonight. It's the, um, it's the one world together at home show. And uh, it was curated by Lady Gaga. I want to see what Lady Gaga's house looks like. I really want to see what Celine Dion's house looks like. I mean, I'm into this. Well, I'm assuming Celine must be sequestered in her Vegas home. Yeah, uh, the maybe. Stones, I think, live all over the world. So you're going to be dealing with uh, different times. Like you could literally be like Saturday night. It'll be four o'clock in the morning in London. Mm -hmm. um, so I was starting to think of just the simple logistics of putting one of these things together. Um, I think it's a great cause. I, I know that the money's raised and there's a lot of people doing fundraisers right now. I know Ryan Reynolds and Haley Wickenheiser have done, miraculous things to mm -hmm. not only raise cash, but to get a whole bunch of equipment, masks, gowns, uh, face guards, gloves, uh, into the hands of the people that need them the most. So Haley and Ryan, what a, I've been watching this whole thing unfold, but, uh, anyway, we're going to be right back. We're going to talk more about 
people's homes and uh, uh, architectural porn when we come back. You're listening to the Jan Arden podcast. <laughs> Adam on the break said there was it was impossible that that was Tom Hanks's kitchen. <laughs> Why do you say that? It was very streamlined. It was very minimalist. It was nice. It was a nice kitchen. I'd be happy with that kitchen, but I feel like he he would have a way grander setup than that. Why do you think that? Some people, he seems like a really humble guy to me. And what exactly are you supposed to have in your kitchen anyway? Like, what are you supposed to have in your kitchen? A, a, an island? Yes. Uh, what did you want? Like, a giant, uh, like, fireplace hearth from... England, 1880, with a, a, a pig on a spit. Like I was just expecting something <laughs> bigger. That's it was a nice kitchen. It was nice. He had a very fancy. I don't know if you noticed. Uh, there was a very fancy espresso machine. I mean, that's like a five thousand dollar espresso machine. Well, there you go. That's where they spent their money on right. coffee. Okay. They don't. They don't care about having a pizza oven. I bet you that's the kind of thing you're looking for. Is like some yes. kind of giant terracotta clay yes. uh, tiled. And, 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 and there was a chef behind him at a safe distance, mind you, like pulling a, a wood-fired pizza out, like, which, yes. oh, I would love to have that. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, those were in my original house plans. And uh, boy, that went away in five minutes when they told me how much they were. Jan, really? would you rather have appliances and windows or <laughs> a pizza oven? I'm like, yeah. oh, I think, I think I'd rather have a floor, appliances and windows. It was That's like 80, crazy. 80 grand or something. No, it was not. Yeah. Oh my For, gosh. Well, so I bought, well, my, my friend Nadine bought me a, this thing from Costco. Yay, Costco. Maybe they could sponsor us. Um, <laughs> that just goes on top of your grill. So whether you have a propane grill or a natural gas, and this thing sets on there. I wish yeah. I knew the name of it. Um, and it gets up to 800 degrees. So you have Is to heat like, it for about- It's like a to, stone? It's a little uh, stainless, it's a steel thing with all this ceramic stone inside. Uh So the gap is about six inches high. It's two feet long. And so they give you the like the little spatula thing to put the pizza in. And I have used that hundreds of times. My friends come over and they're like, oh, I want that. And I always say, oh, I was at Costco. No one has ever been able to find it since. So I, you know how Costco has stuff and then they don't have stuff. And yep. anyway, I'm telling you, I've had more joy out of my $250 little Costco pizza oven. And especially now I've used it in the last six weeks, five or six times. And I think like for me, I feel like you want to see, you know, the, the, the celebrity homes in one of two ways. I either want them to be (laughs) over the top, wild, crazy, like everything above, like all that. I want it to be the $80,000 piece oven, or I want it to be a very real, very down to earth tour, uh, like the $250 Costco pizza oven accessory. Like I, I think I would appreciate both just as much. When we filmed the Jan show season one, yeah. the house that was my house that people yeah. always ask me, did you live in that house? I'm like, <laughs> no, I did not. Anyway, they, um, they'd never let anyone film in their house before. And I don't blame them. I'm sure they'll never do it again. But the reason that uh, one of the production guys chose this house and literally begged these people to let us film in it is the kitchen was so streamlined. I believe they were Belgium and Swiss or something like that. If I'm getting this wrong, people that own that house who are listening, forgive me. (laughs) But um, there was no uh, cupboard door handles. They all clicked. Like you couldn't, I didn't know where the fridge was because it was behind the same facade as everything else. So I probably would have spent a year in that house wandering around clicking doors, looking for the appliances. (laughs) Like even the stove, you click something, this thing came up and then went back down into the wall. So the burners, it was all cream white. Um, The chairs were very like modular looking. Anyway, it wasn't my deal. I have junk everywhere. I have (laughs) photographs of my parents like stuck into the cracks between like the drywall and the tile and I have crap everywhere. So I know I'm on the verge of hoarders, but I'm, I just want you to know that you're welcome to come to my house anytime and snoop around. Yeah. That's, I feel like you should do a Jan Arden cribs tour because that's the commentary that I want along the way. (laughs) Okay. Done.
like this is from that. And well, everything that I have has, it's very purposeful. And trust me, in the last six weeks, I've heard everyone cleaning drawers out, everyone going through their closets and getting stuff ready for, you know, women's shelters and dress for success and all these different charities. I've not done one thing like that. I've not, I open my junk drawer every day and I'm like, because I knew that dogs' nail clippers were in there. I actually tried to clip Mitty's nails last week. I was so scared of hurting her. Um, I just, it was hopeless. But it took me 10 minutes to find the nail clippers underneath all the crap. The batteries, playing cards, gum, lip balms, pencils. Uh, I, I must have had 15 of those little monkey wrenches that you get with Ikea furniture. Why am I keeping those? It's just a personality type, I think, because I have so many friends who are the same way and they always joke and preface whenever I come over that I can't go through any of their junk drawers or anything because I'll just start throwing stuff out and I'll just start naturally cleaning. Like my place is a bizarre minimalist (laughs) tomb. And so on the other end of the spectrum, you do come into my place and kind of wonder if anyone lives here. Um, But it's just the way my brain works. Yeah, totally. Like it's just the way my brain works. You will not think that at my house. <laughs> you will go, oh my God. My friends always say, like my friend Teresa is like, oh, you're just, you're so much like your mom. Aww. And my mom had so much stuff, but, ev- and I don't mean hoarder stuff. She, um, she had a lot of stuff, but everything was very purposeful. Well, your dad mm-hmm. and I got that when we went up to Alaska. And that's the sweater that I had. For, I mean, the clothes that I went through um, when mom and dad both passed away and I was moving the house uh, to my horror found a joy of sex book underneath <laughs> their mattress in their bedroom. Oh my gosh. And so it's just, and I felt very voyeuristic and I'm cleaning the house. Like I'm doing something that's very, I have to do this. Like I have to like mom's little bathroom station, opening up her little cupboards. And she had like old Avon jars of cream that had just an old hardened cream and they look like roses or they look like frogs or, you know how Avon used to make stuff look like things all the time with a, Oh, it it looks like a fireplace tool. No, it's a lip balm. (laughs) But uh, it was was very weird going through my parents' stuff. If I have children, I've robbed them of that pleasure because they'll just, they would just show up here after I died and go, okay, well, she never kept anything, didn't own anything, and no one might have lived here in the first place. So it's, it's just was bizarre. Your, was your mom like that? Um, no, not, not to this extent. She's very tidy. She's very clean for sure, but she definitely hangs on to things much more than I do. Um, I was like this from the time I was a little kid. Like I would stay up late at night before I went to sleep and I had a huge section of stuffed animals and I would take the time to organize them. So they were all facing forward and I would even brush the fur out of their eyes. If throughout the day, the teddy bears furs had like brushed into their face, I thought it made them look sad. So I would organize them all, stand them up, and I would brush their little faces. <laughs> like, I couldn't sleep until I'd done it. You know, when this is all over, Caitlin, you could be of great assistance to people. You, <laughs> could, you could rent yourself out by the hour and go at least organize plush toys for, you know, children's. You, you could organize children's bedrooms. It's my new side gig. Um, we're all so different. and we're, We've got so many quicks and quirks and quarks is that what I'm saying (laughs) and uh, it's amazing to me how much I am learning about people that I have known for 25 35 years and they're telling me like deep dark secrets right now like I'm blown away by the inside track that I'm getting on people that I thought I knew and they're telling me like stuff that they're doing at home and like I, I don't know why do you think people are so open we got like 30 seconds and then we'll come back but go I think it's because people have more time and they're actually talking on the phone. They're having conversations. They aren't texting anymore and they're just a little more emotional. It's part of that whole empathy thing that's happening to the world. And they're thinking, you know, if the world's going to hell in a handbasket, then I hope a few people knew me along the way. To be known. That's what we all aspire to. You're listening to the Jan Arden podcast. We'll be right back. We're so grateful for one thing that you guys are listening and thank you for coming along with us this last six weeks. It's, uh, it does us a lot of good. Um, I didn't give Adam a chance to talk about things that are changing in his world 
as far as being vulnerable or, or things that are coming up. So I, I want to hear from you, Adam. Well, we're just taking the time right now to um, do all the things around the house that we never have time to do. Which is? Cleaning up the cupboards, going through the linen closet, going through the basement, um, finding stuff for Goodwill, which we're not dropping off at any boxes. I know that we're holding off on that because you can't do that right now, right? Yeah. Like so we're just collecting stuff to give away uh, or hand me down stuff to family or again, just yep. uh, Goodwill. Finding things that were lost. Oh, that's where that was. Oh, I was looking for that. And it's nice to come across uh, things that you've been looking for that have finally resurfaced. And then, and some of my friends are doing this too. Like, I think I'm not the only one doing this because a buddy of mine just sent me, um, he's like, oh, I found all the old, uh, all these old matchbooks that I was collecting and just stuff that were, and, and then I sent I him. I love like, that. And I'm like, oh, here, I've been collecting, I, this is my collection. And then I texted him, I said, dude, you know this quarantine situation is getting ugly when we're sharing pictures <laughs> of our matchbook collection. <laughs> well, I think, you know, like Caitlin was alluding to before the break, we want to be known. And anyone that's uh, a teacher of philosophy or you know, mental wellness or therapists or psychiatrists, psychologists, they always speak to the desire of human beings to be known. That, that's a lot of why we partner up. That's why we look for this other person in our lives to share our lives with because we, we desperately do want to be known. So if anything, this, this last six-week period has presented us with a very unique opportunity to show ourselves to people. And yeah. in a way that is meaningful, and maybe it is because we feel it's the end coming or that we were scared enough to think that, you know what, I'm not going to hold back anymore. I think it's very true. I know we've talked about this before on the show. And again, doesn't resonate with everyone. And it certainly isn't uh, science or anything. But when people talk about astrology, and I think why it resonates with some people, why you have new takes on astrology with apps like CoStar and The Pattern. And uh, that writer that I referenced before, she's an astrologist, her name's Chani Nicholas, like part of what I think really clicks with people and why they're interested in it, why they read their horoscope, even if it's sort of categorized as fluff, is when you have something that resonates with you and you feel like kind of gets you or actually reflects who you are, you feel seen in a, in a way, you feel seen and you feel understood, like something out there just clicks in. And uh, that's really important and really powerful for people, that moment of going, hey, that's me this gets me, this sees me, and, and they really get something out of it. Well, I think in order to be known, you have to take that step outside of yourself to show people who you are. So there's a real two, two it's a, a two-edged sword for sure, because there's a lot of fear in being judged for showing people who you are. But then if you don't, then no one is going to know your authentic self. Mm -hmm. So it's great to see people talking. It's great to see actual phone calls and Zoom calls and FaceTime. I can't believe FaceTime and, and Zoom and all these things haven't collapsed in on themselves. <laughs> people are having, like uh, on, at Easter last week, people were having 12 people for dinner and everyone had their computers. Um, I saw this clip from a guy in Italy who lived alone, who was having, I think his parents lived somewhere, his sister lived somewhere, his nieces and nephews. So he had his phone there, but there was, there was 10, like basically little screens up on his screen and he was having dinner with his family. Um, but, but they were talking away. And, and normally, you know, the, the irony of it, you'd probably have everyone over for an Easter dinner and everyone would be on their phones off doing their own thing. So contrary to what we thought would happen, People are, are glued to their screens, listening and engaging with people. Like I was on, I was on a Zoom birthday party uh, this week on Thursday night, and there were 33 people on the Zoom birthday party. The theme was actually Burning Man. Do you know the Burning Man festival? That yes, happened? yes. Oh, everybody dressed up in their best Burning Man attire. Like I literally cut a neck hole in a garbage bag and wore a garbage bag, but it's just silly. And I was thinking to myself, you know, this exact group of people would never get together in real life. And, uh, but you know, you're all actively listening, you're doing something together and you're, you're trying to like connect. And 
it was just cool. This just, it wouldn't really happen this way any other, any other time, unless we were in the middle of a, of a viral pandemic. Good things come from bad things. Always. Um, there's a lot of talk about what is considered an essential service these days. And I've been just reading some really funny things of how people are trying to always go around what rules and regulations are. There's always those people, right, that consider themselves an essential service. There was, um, there was a woman in Ohio that was literally sneaking people in her back door to cut their hair. Yes. Um, and we've seen a lot of online haircuts that have gone very sideways, a lot of dog grooming. I'm, I'm guilty of that. <laughs> Mitty looks like, I don't know, it, it just, it looks like she was in a pandemic and her owner had to groom her is what <laughs> she looks like. But so, yeah, this woman was, was bringing people in and, and the Cleveland cops basically got the nod from neighbors, I think, or somebody, mm-hmm. somebody ratted her out Yeah, for her to shut this down. Like, I think she was being safe, but she was like, having people come in there desperate to get their hair dyed. Well, this is the thing. So they're calling them speakeasy salons because it's like, you know, prohibition era when this was the man. So she's <laughs> this is ushering. So funny. I know. And she's like ushering people in, in the back door. And uh, it's, it is crazy because from a, from a healthcare perspective, it is super risky because we have well, no it's way. Well, manicures, of, pedicures. Yeah. And also like, we have no way of knowing where these people have been. They have no way of knowing where everyone else has been. Like, it's just, it's impossible to make that scenario safe. So I am like, if, if you know of a speakeasy salon, by all means, report it to your local bylaw officers or whoever you would have to report it to, because that's a big no. But I just thought to myself, it is, it is very, um, it's very weird for people to have ac- their access cut off to their hairdresser or to their manicurist. And we were talking before about this big concert that's happening tonight, um, the, the, the Together at Home concert that's airing on CTV, the one curated by Lady Gaga. What will all these celebrities look like? without their usual hair and makeup and their like, what will they, they are, they're missing what in Hollywood would be defined as definitely essential service. Listen, I have been going on some of these Instagram lives like Lizzo had one. Some of these rappers are having one. I, I don't know about you guys, but I am sitting here by myself. You're seeing me. This is me in my isolation. So I click on to this Lizzo Instagram live thing the other night She was talking to a rapper. His name escapes me. Really beautiful, handsome uh, African-American man uh, in this. It looked like a high rise. I could see kind of cityscape out the windows. Lizzo was twerking and doing her weird stuff and (laughs) playing beats. He, the guy, I can't believe I can't remember his name, had 15 people with him. There was 15 people in this room. So I kept, I keep asking myself, have they all been quarantined together? Like I, someone explain this to me. I don't know what's going on. Like they're, they're in this apartment. There's nowhere for 15 people to sleep. So I am just like gobsmacked at the audacity. I mean, if they are indeed all quarantined together, which I highly doubt I think there's no way that they're all possibly providing essential services for whoever that individual was. A, B, I've seen this and thought the same thing. And I love, I'm like Rihanna's biggest fan, but I watched Rihanna. Rihanna's another one. She's got 10 people with her. So it was her. And then I saw, I saw at least her best friend, Melissa Ford. And I also saw another guy who I'm guessing is a friend that's doing her hair and makeup because she looked like 10 on 10. And then she was FaceTiming with a whole other group of people somewhere else. And they look like they were in a home movie theater and there must have been 15 people there. And I just thought, first of all, how are you all getting there? How are you all getting home? What in the world is going on? Because everybody's So I'm drinking. not the only one that's been thinking this. No, and then I felt like a weird nerd where I was like, I should just be excited that I'm seeing Rihanna. And instead I'm worried about how many people are around her. I can't get past that. I can't get past the how many people are in the room. So every time Lizzo pops up, like I'll go on. It's one thing, I mean- I'll pop in on Cheryl Hickey and she's just there with her kids. Yeah. And, you know, she's been filming some stuff and, you know, I see the cameraman way the hell 40 feet away and even Ellen DeGeneres doing her show from home, uh, her sidekick. So the DJ guy, he's in his own home. uh, He's linked in, but um, her pal, that's always the guy that's always scaring people. What's his name? Andy Lassner. And so Andy's standing outside the window on his phone. 
Yeah. And, and he's cutting out all the time and she's sitting in her chair. But anyway, she's doing isolation, right? She doesn't yeah. have, and she looks very plain. She's not wearing makeup. Her hair is cute. She's just kind of in sweats and stuff like that. Anyway, these are all big questions and we're running out of time. <laughs> uh, I don't even know how to summarize today's podcast. All I know is what have we gleaned from this today? Adam, show people who you are. Yeah, Adam, tell us what we've, what we've, uh, recap the whole show, please, in like 30 seconds. <laughs> this is pressure. This is pressure. <laughs> no, just how we're coping and how we're dealing with it and what we're doing to, to get by and support each other and support ourselves and how we need to nourish our souls and our minds and our bodies. Uh, not bad, eh? Oh, you like that? Well, don't make uh, me cry. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, no, no. I didn't mean to do that. But I just thought that, like, it's, it's, it's important to it's a it's a time of of reflection and being um, with family and friends and, and being women. better and being better. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you guys once again. I look forward to this all week to do this me podcast. Too. Me too. It just makes me feel like and and I do feel light more lighthearted than I did when we were doing this a month ago. I feel like. I can hear it in your voices. We just all sound more hopeful and more optimistic. Yeah, there's still some crap things going on. Uh, but it's like every day I wake up and I'm like, we're one day closer. We're one day closer to being a better human race. And that feels pretty damn good. Yeah. And humans are effing resilient. So there you go. <laughs> they are. We're going to just leave it at that. You've been listening to the Jan Arden Podcast. We hope to see you again next week. Toodly do, everybody. Stay home. Stay home.